Okay, so today we continue presenting the process uh, for development uh, of uh, your projects uh, and uh, we, with the aim at, uh, uh, say, closing the left, the left uh, column of this uh, diagram, okay? Um, all the analysis phase uh, that should be accomplished before starting the design and implementation phases. So actually, what we had here is, uh, is uh, um, last time we had a look uh, at the vision document uh, that we should prepare by the end of the month. Uh, and uh, we discussed a bit about the requirement solicitation, uh, where we discussed about involving the users, getting their feedback, getting information, and so on. You see that this part uh, is not colored in this slide, meaning that it's not a required step. Mm. If you can do some little informal solicitation, so uh, some little informal uh, uh, talk or discussion with some users uh, for for the vision document, uh, it would be better. Mm? But it's not uh, officially required, there's no uh, specific point, specific task for that. Uh, on the contrary, we need to spend a bit of time uh, on the analysis phase. So all the, you see the dates, uh, more or less, all the month of, of, um, of April will be on the analysis uh, of the requirements of the system. Mm? Requirements will be the keyword. Should be. No, it's not this page, this one. Okay. Uh, so this step would be starting from the initial vision of what you want to achieve and uh, some inputs from external users. You have uh, a pretty good idea, hmm? even if it's a bit informal, it's not yet complete, uh, but you have an idea of what the system should do. What are at least uh, the main uh, uh, functionality that the system should provide. Hmm? What's its core? What's the, the kernel of the, of the value for the project? But that's not enough hmm, for, there's not enough information for starting coding stuff. We need to go into more detail through an analysis step. This is an analysis step meaning that uh, we need to think and reason and uh, take some information that is already there and make it explicit and uh, add uh, some details. So at this stage, we are not uh, sort of uh, changing the project or adding new information. We are just uh, formalizing what is already there. Hmm? We are trying to formalize uh, what will be implemented, what will not be implemented in this specific prototype, and maybe what could be the next step for the implementation. So, um, we, we have a vision, you, we said one page of description. Of course, one page of description is not a specification. You cannot give it to an external programmer and say, please implement this. Because they will say, this is just an idea, this is just a, a, a general uh, hypothesis. Uh, it's not anything specific, formalized to understand uh, what is in and what is out. So what is in the system and what is out of the system. Uh, in the vision or in the general description, you can have a very possibly wide idea. Oh, you, we could work in this area, in this sector. The project will do this, but may do several different things. At a given point, uh, you need to fix and to decide which things will be implemented and which things uh, will not be implemented, at least in the first version of the project. So we need to, to uh, how to say, to take responsibility for making some design choices. So we cannot always say, oh, the system could also do something more, or this feature could be there or not, depending, we will decide. At a given point, we need to decide. So we decide a set of functionalities, a set of, we call them requirements, uh, that define what the system does, and every requirement uh, requires, that's the name for it, uh, 
requires the system for to do a specific thing thing and uh, uh, how these things should be implemented so we'll talk about uh, functionalities and the constraints for the modality of implementing these functionalities uh, we will be more precise in a couple of slides so try to think uh, the list of requirements as a sort of a contract there should be enough information for someone else to be able to build your system to do the design selecting the components and so on so that creating something that has the functionality that you need hmm? um, Of course, we, we don't have all the implementation details, the name of the classes or the methods or so on in the, in the requirements. We only list what is important to us. Everything that is in the requirement should be implemented. Everything that is not in the requ requirement is out of scope. It could be a good idea, but we are not committing to implementing that. Okay, so let's try to be clear in this way. Imagine that you write your requirement, give it to someone else, and their summarize will come back a couple of months later saying you, okay, this is your system. We need, you need to evaluate whether the work they did, the system they built, is actually what you specified, what you wanted at the beginning to start with. So these requirements should be clear, synthetic, precise and most of all verifiable uh, I should be able to point out to this let's say outsourcing developer say okay but you didn't implement point number seven because you see it's written this way and your system your system does something differently so the level of detail of precision in which you write requirements should be the one in which you could evaluate whether a given system built by somebody else would satisfy all of them would you pay for it if you, if you outsource it to somebody else? They would come back and say, okay, this is your system, give me 5,000 euros. And so you need to have a way uh, of deciding whether actually the product they delivered is the product you have specified. This is a general problem, it's not just in the course. Every time you have a contract for developing something, it's the most important thing is having some instrument, some tools, some knowledge about uh, what is the, what the criteria for accepting the final work. You will probably see many, many hours of people arguing with each other, saying, okay, but this is what you had in mind, this is what you told me, I thought this is what better, and so on, because they disagree on what the system should look like. The, 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 um, the designer of the system, the, who, the person who specified it and the implementer of the system may have different vision. Huh? You remember the, the swing pictures. And so this document here should not be, in our case, very long, huh? but at least of precise things that we will be able to tick off from the final, let's say, acceptance testing. In this case, you are committing yourself to do these items hmm? so you always have a chance uh, of changing them as you go hmm? but let's try to think them in this way so we are you i, I see uh, i said the, the month of uh, april should be devoted mostly to this requirement engineering process so what it means well it means uh, trying to understand what are the services the functionalities the pages, the devices, the sensors, and, uh, and so on, that the customer requires from the system. So again, customer or user is the keyword here. I'm not implementing a functionality because I like it. I'm implementing a functionality because it brings value to the user, or because it's necessary to another functionality that brings value. So among the list of uh, one billion possible things to implement, we should select the ones that could fit in our time frame, in our budget, and uh, bring the most value to the project. To the project means to the users of the project. And at the same time, the constraints under which uh, these requirements should be implemented. 
uh, constraints means uh, the speed, the programming language, the response time, the resources that you use, and so on. Okay, if you are going to have your system running on a Raspberry Pi, for example, uh, you cannot use very complicated or uh, very complex algorithms, uh, or you cannot use a lot of uh, you know, terabytes of memory of hard disk because you don't have them on, the, on board. So we, you will have some constraints coming from the environment, coming from the user and so on, that will force you to decide in how to implement a functionality in a specific way. If you are implementing some sensor in Arduino, you are bound to program in the language of Arduino board, for example. So you cannot choose, oh, you want to do that in, uh, in JavaScript, for example. No, it's not possible. There's a constraint in which you, can, you will deliver this functionality. So you, we should also make those explicit. Hmm? Uh, if, uh, I don't know, and timing constraints, if uh, uh, we, I have a functionality that says that when a user enters a room, uh, then music will start playing. With this sentence is also valid if the music will start playing after one hour. But this is not what we wanted. So we have one functionality. When I enter a room, music should start, should, should start playing. And those are constraints. These actions should happen within the two seconds maximum, one second maximum of maximum delay before delivering the functionality. So we have a lot of, uh, that this two seconds maximum time is not uh, another feature. It's not another function of the system. It's a constraint that we apply on existing features. Hmm? We'll, uh, we'll be, uh, we will call them uh, in uh, functional versus non-functional requirements in a minute. Uh, so what we want to achieve uh, is the set of requirements and the requirements engineering is the process the work for getting there uh, talking about requirements in general well it's a very wide uh, uh, meaning it may may have a very wide meaning from something very very abstract uh, the system should uh, you know manage uh, all the uh, heating in the house it's a requirement it's not very precise it's a high level requirement it's a general one or can be something more more specific so uh, when the user presses the red button then switch the lights off it's also a requirement the, both of things describe what the system should do they describe it at different levels of detail and uh, of course uh, we cannot go in the requirement document to a very very fine level of detail because otherwise we are implementing the system uh, we should stop when the implementation is clear and doesn't matter i don't i don't need to specify more for having a good implementation of the system of course w during the implementation there will be still uh, degrees of freedom so in the requirements i will probably not specify the technology. If I need the, if the functions of the system needs to have a, a temperature sensor, for example. So the requirement should be that the system should be able to measure the temperature with a given frequency, with a given precision. And then it's up to the implementation phase to decide whether the sensor should be wired, should be wireless should be Z-Way, should be Zigbee, should be Wi-Fi, depending on a lot of other factors. We don't need to specify them at the beginning. So we want to leave freedom of implementation to the people that will decide how to implement the stuff. But uh, we should be clear about what is the functionality that in the end needs to be delivered. Do it with the technology you like better, but uh, as long as it delivers this specific functionality within these constraints, within this time, this precision, this memory, this space, this language, and so on. Hmm? So we need to start thinking in this way. We are planning what to do for ourselves, but we are hmm, defining the result of what we want to achieve, not the details of how we will do that. Um, in general, you can 
split the level of detail of the requirements in two different layers. The top layer, the more, the more general layer, is called something, sometimes it's called the, the user requirements. User requirements uh, are requirements that are written for customers, written for the users. The idea of a user requirement is they may be boring, probably, but the user should be able to understand them. Imagine having a user and you want to convince that user to buy your system that you're building. The system is not ready there yet. It's not there. It's not ready. So you cannot show it to the user. You can only explain it to the user and they, you must convince them to put money, hmm? to put their money to create the, the, the system. So you should be able to describe precisely what the system would do in a way that the, that the users will understand it. So not technical jargon, no diagram, no languages, no flowcharts, no, probably, but a list of functionalities. Something to go with the vision. The vision is general. It helps to inspire the users. But then you have the list, the more detailed list of functions. So what the system will do, we in a written in a language that is also understandable by users. And the second level of detail is what we call the system requirements or developer requirements or technical requirements. Additional items that are just for the developers. The users don't care. So if I want to use a specific uh, programming framework, a specific uh, technology, or because hmm, it's, a, it's a constraint that they want to add, I can do that in that second part that is usually not part of the contract with the user will be part of the contract with the developer. So you are in between. On one side, you have the users, and you should sell your idea, your project to the users, and list what the system does in a language that the users can understand. On the other side, you have a subcontractor that will implement the system. So you need to tell them what they need to implement. And so this is a more detailed level. Of course, the second level will include the first, uh, but will add uh, some more detailed information. So this is the way you, are try you, you should try to think uh, when thinking about requirements. Three different le levels, the end user, this, the system engineer, and the implementer of the system. Of course, in this course, we will play all the three uh, figures, but mm, try to separate them at least uh, mentally. So, for example, if uh, you are creating an online platform for managing documents, this, is, this example is taken from this kind of idea, a user requirement could be a sentence like, the software must provide a means of representing accessing external files edited by other tools. So it means that Okay, in my platform, I can store files, and when I click, when I open those files, uh, an external tool, another tool, maybe a Word or a PDF, uh, a reader, whatever, will start, uh, will open the document for me. This is uh, um, something that the user should understand. The system requirements is uh, the set of uh, technical items that are needed, that needs to be, need to be implemented for delivering that user level functionality. So for example, external files can be edited by other tools. So you have a notion of file type. You have different types of files, and for every different type, you have probably a different tool that will be able to manage that. So Word file will be opened by Word, and AutoCAD file should be opened by AutoCAD, and so on. So, from a technical point of view, to the programmer, I need to say that, okay, uh, you, we, we, we must have some function to define the types of files. So, maybe they can be extended with new extensions. Uh, each file type will have an associated tool, so I need to provide matching between file types and uh, external tools. And also, probably, as an icon to go with the type of file, so it will be more visible in the, in the, in the file list. And, uh, and the icon probably could be a, 
personalized by the user. And when the user selects an icon uh, with an external file, it means that the tool associated with the external file type uh, should be open uh, uh, on that specific file. So these are actually different functionalities that needs to be there in the system in order for the user to be happy about this functionality. Actually, the only real mandatory functionality is the last one. When the user clicks or selects a file with a specific icon, the tool associated will be started. This is the minimum functionalities. The other ones, okay, are the possibility of personalizing the file types, or possibility of uh, personalizing the tools, the possibility of personalizing the icons, and so on. So these are additional functions that could be there or not. This is something that we are starting to learn about the requirements. They tend, if they are written well, they tend to be independent from each other. You could imagine perfectly a system that doesn't include uh, functionality 1.3. All icons will be equal or they will be predefined. No way of customizing them. Is it nice? Probably not. Is it legal? Is it feasible? Yes. Why not? If we think it's not so important, we don't need to include it. Hmm? So as much as possible, requirements should be independent, orthogonal from each other. You can decide to leave one out, or you can decide to include them. And at the same time, which is the same thing from a different point of view, you can check each one of them separately. I can imagine a test for checking whether 1.1 is implemented correctly. I can imagine a test when they deliver me the system to check whether 1.2 is actually implemented and is working correctly and so on. So they can be implemented separately, independently from each other, and they can be tested independently from each other. In that way, we have a system that can grow, and it, at any step, I can understand what the system does and what still doesn't do hmm? at this level. Of course, uh, the level of description that we will provide in our projects uh, is more close to the user requirements rather than the specific uh, detailed list of uh, technical specifications. Hmm? Basically, we, call, we don't want to spend too much time. We want to concentrate, to focus on the most important features. And the rest, the developer, we will be the developer, so the details can be decided later. Uh, actually, below the system requirements, we, we have even a more precise requirement level that is called the software specification, where, for example, you uh, design the, num the, the names of the tools, the languages, how to communicate, how they communicate with each other, what are the names of the packages or the classes, uh, some more detail, because actually if you want to involve some external developer, you should give them instruction very clearly how that their portion of the system should fit into the global system. Hmm? Um, we, of course, we won't go uh, into this, uh, this level because it will take really a lot of time. But if you are in the, say in, the in the software industry, this is what happens. So we have uh, usually um, a consulting or design company that proposes a system to a client, to a customer, and then delivers does they, what they call this the analysis of the user requirements, of the user needs, and they come up with a set of documents that they can give to other companies, external companies, that do only the implementation. And so in this case, all of these details are needed, of course, because you are writing a contract saying, okay, you need to implement this specifically. Uh, what is interesting is the set of people that, that should be able to read or are the targets of these different levels of requirement. He said that the user requirement level can be understood by end users 
also by managers so people who will be able to commit a budget for the project your managers or the manager of your, of your uh, client so client managers or contractor managers and of course uh, uh, end users and also technical picture technical figures technical people hmm? engineers of your client or engineers uh, of your company at the lower levels the end users and uh, uh, the managers tend to disappear we don't need them anymore from this level down the uh, important is that um, the technical people that should be able to understand how the project is going on hmm? I kept the users here the end users here because usually during the prototyping testing evaluation of the intermediate projects you want to involve users there they don't need uh, probably to read the system requirements but they can be involved in the testing phase of the prototypes of the system hmm? so since the readers of the, doc of the document are different also the language will be different also the complexity level the technical levels will be different in this course I said that we are committing to this level so again in the requirement documents we don't need or we should not include any technical language because they still need to be understandable by the end users right okay and uh, what kind of requirements can we write? So imagine a requirement being a single sentence or something like that. We find that there are three levels or three types of requirements, which are quite different. At least the first is very different from the second and third. The second and third are more similar to each other, are different aspects of the same type of requirement. But there's a big difference between the first and the second. The first requirements are the functional requirements functional so what are the functions that the system will provide not functions in terms of a C code function or a Python function but in general system functionality functionality at the system level so functionality for the user remember at the system level the services the functions the actions the features that the system will provide uh, if you go to if you open any open source project any uh, website of any software product there's also you always have a page named features where you have a list of items or things that the system that specific software will do this is the most important list the first thing that we need to check to understand whether that software is good for what we are trying to do so I want to encode the video in this form okay in the list of features is there what I need or not um, so this we will be the list of the things or the functions that the system will be able to do do this is the verb things that the system does these are the functional requirements and they are mostly independent from each other so if the system is able to do one thing it doesn't imply that the system is also able to do a, a different thing if I can log in yes it doesn't mean I can register on the website probably it would be stupid to have one without the others but you can imagine a valid system which you cannot register because somebody else will enroll you you can log in on the portal della didattica at the university website but you cannot register to it because it's a separate procedure so they are separate each functionality is separate from the others it can be there or not we decide what will be there and what will not be there non-functional requirements they are also called quality requirements but it's a it's a bit misleading uh, using the term quality because it doesn't qualify uh, or uh, in general quality is something that is perceived as uh, informal or analog not not really precise uh, while uh, non-functional requirements are usually precise 
are these, these non-functional requirements, uh, so we call them non-functional because we don't have any better name, are the constraints on the services of functions, so constraints on the above functional requirements, such as timing constraints, developing constraints, language constraints, and so on. So if you are saying the system will be used uh, with a smartphone Android from version four, 5 or more recent than that. This is not a functional requirement. Saying that uh, the system should run on Android doesn't tell you what the system does. It, it only tells you that whatever the system does, it needs to be done on an Android system. So it's a constraint on how, or what is the environment, uh, what is the, the attributes to apply to the functional requirements. Uh, it's a, it's a cross information. You need to specify what the system will do, and also the constraints in which this, that will be implemented. So one thing is uh, to say it needs to run on Android. The another thing is, need, uh, is to say I need to the system will need to, to run on, a, on an iPhone, on iOS. Of course, uh, you can have one, you can have the, uh, another, one of the Android or iOS, and uh, the implementation of the system will be different. The same functionalities, but they will be implemented in completely different ways. For example, in different languages, because on Android you program in Java, and in the uh, iOS you program in Objective-C. So the same functionalities will be implemented in a completely different way because of a non-functional requirement. The non-functional requirement will not tell you what the system does, but will tell you how it needs to be implemented, what, uh, what are the qualities of the system. Another non-functional requirement, the language. The system should, should, be, should have a, a, a user interface in Italian or in English or in five different languages. And so all the implementation of the system should take that into account. Every single string in a system, every single screen or web page or label or button that you will implement for providing the functions needs to be in Italian or needs to be in English or needs to be in five different languages. And that will be different because you, have, you need to have a way of switching. It's different building a system for one language or building a system for more than one language. The way you're implementing it is different. Hmm? So actually, specifying the language doesn't specify anything the system does. It's totally independent from the functionalities, but it affects the way in which you need to implement the functionalities. Uh, there are also some non-functional requirements uh, that you are not... Uh, that are not under your control. They are a consequence of the domain. For example, uh, something that comes from the regulations. If you are building a system that needs to handle, uh, I don't know, money, or the, a budget of a company or whatever, you have a lot of regulations about how you to do the budget, compute taxes, uh, uh, how to uh, compute the active and passive roles, and so on. So, they are not uh, functional requirements. They don't tell you what to do. They tell you, but uh, that the results should be computed in this way, this is not possible, this uh, uh, should comply with this regulation, and so on. And they are not requirements that we have introduced. They are already there because our application is in a given domain. If you are building an electronic system, you will have a lot of uh, regulation about uh, um, electromagnetic compatibility, safety, and so on, huh? and warranty, and all the warnings of the system, and they should be there. Because the law requires them, because the context requires them. If you're building a system that will go into an hospital, you should be extra careful about the types of, the types of text, uh, the tests that you need to do. If you're building something for the aerospace industry, you, it will be much more, much more complex because you will have 5,000 pages 
of additional requirements, whatever your system will do, you will have to comply with those. So there are different domains that will come with a <laughs> set of predefined uh, non-functional requirements. They are non-functional because in general, this regulation don't tell you what your system does, of course. They, but they put some constraints, they put some um, regulations, basically. Hmm? So from our point of view, they are all the, of the same kind, the non-functional requirements and the domain requirements. With the difference that the non-functional requirements are under our control, the domain requirements are implied, implicit, in the application domain in which we want to sell our product. In our simple case in the course, we, we don't care about this domain requirement because we are just doing some things. But our domain requirements uh, are, for example, I already gave you some. Uh, la dispe. So the system should be able to run and to be demoed in la dispe and should be easy to move. No? It's something that we, we discussed last time. So these are kind of domain requirements. And the domain is the MEI course, and if you want to make a project for the MEI core, course, uh, you need to fulfill these requirements. They are additional. They are independent on what you are going to do. They are not under your control. They are under some higher regulation, which is me in this case, but uh, which is in general the, the, the feasibility of the project. Okay? So these are very specific cases. But these two functional requirements, non-functional requirements, are are important, are what we need to do. Okay, in the month of April, we need to write them for your project. So again, I will stress that functional requirements tell you only what the system does and not how. What functions the system offers to the users. System, user, what they do with each other. Nothing else is important. Not the developer, not the sensors, not the network. We are talking about users and what they do with the system. We don't care yet how these features will be implemented, how this functionality will be implemented. And the way to write them hmm, is uh, a list of features, as I said, the, the features of the system, Make a list, uh, which may be longer or shorter, depending how complex the system is, and try to make this list, uh, or the items in this list, uh, local. If I read a, a feature of a system, ideally, I could, I could go into the source code of the program of the system and say, okay, these are the programming lines, these are the 25 or 100 or 2,000 lines that are needed for implementing that specific feature. So there, it should be easy to have a mapping between a functional requirement and a portion of your code. Uh, maybe different portion in different files, but you should be able to do this mapping. This code, uh, imagine the other way around, when you are writing code, if somebody stops you and tells you, why are, why are you writing that line of code? And the answer should be, because I'm implementing that requirement. This line of code is needed to make that possible, to implement that function. Hmm? So that, it, you know, it's easy to implement these functions one by one by putting code into the system. You add one function, maybe you need to add one button, so you change the user interface, you add the button handler, so you add code there. But that po those portions of code are there because you are implementing that functionality. If you don't need that functionality anymore, you know what to remove. It's all local. If that functionality doesn't work, if there's a bug, you know where to look for. Okay? We will learn next week the... the the Git version control system, so it will be easy also to manage with branches all the different functions uh, in different commits or different branches of your, of your project, so that you can actually really see and, uh, the implementation of every function. If they are local, they are easy to add or remove from the system, they are easy to, to test, they are easy to debug, 
so the, I try to make uh, some list of uh, functional requirements for the example, the wake up uh, project uh, that I mentioned last time. Uh, one thing I, you noted that these are numbers. Functional requirement 3, 3.1, 3.2, 4.4, 4.4, 4.1, and so on. So I'm imagining a tree of requirements. Uh, depending on the area, maybe uh, functional requirement 3, all the tree is uh, about uh, um, the running of the wake up call, 4 is about the configuration of the future calls. So I have different functional areas. I can identify different functional areas. And inside each functional area, I have different functional requirements. I give a number, so it will be easier for me to refer to that later in the call, for example. And uh, the, so this is the first thing I, 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 I see, the number, the giving an, an ID. You can number, you can call them A, B, C, D, you can give them pet names, whatever, as long as they're easy to identify. Second, all of them start with the, the user. So we are describing the things that the system allows the user to do. There will be some functional requirements that are more probably hidden, like the system will do a backup of its, of its data every night. Okay, this is something that the user should not be involved in. But there should be a minority. Most of, uh, that will be a functional requirement. Either you do the, back the backup or you, or you don't. And when you do, it's a specific part of code that does this functionality. So it's a perfectly valid functional requirement that doesn't involve the user. It can happen. But most of the functional requirements probably, and the most important ones, should involve the users. Should involve services that the system gives to their users. So, for example, would be the user must be able to activate or deactivate the webcast service. And this will be applied until the user changes it again. I can imagine a user reading and understanding this sentence. There's nothing technical in that. Technically, I would say that uh, for every user, for every user, I have uh, the state of the system that can be on or off, and there should be a toggle functionality somewhere to change that. Okay, but this is something that we only understand. The user will not understand that. Silence is the wake up service just for the next day. So it's a different. I'm not switching it off until I change my, my idea, but I only switch it off for the next day, and functionality will be resumed automatically for the next, for the following day. So it's another functionality I want to have in my system. The user must be able to set an ad hoc wake up call that we only run once, will not be remembered and will have specific settings. Just, okay, tomorrow I need to go you know, to take a plane, so it will be only tomorrow, a specific uh, time. And, uh, and once I set, I can configure the settings, so I can modify it once it's set. Or I can modify the, the default setting for creating new ad hoc calls. So you see that these are hierarchically one level deeper because they are functions that are actually sub-functions of the first one. That are additional functions that work together in the context of the previous one. So these are just some examples here and there of the way in which you are trying to write these requirements. So you can play and try imagining deleting any of them and the system will do just fine with, a, with one function less. It will be a bit less helpful, a bit less useful, but still uh, be a, being a valid system. So our question will also be, what are the most important items in this list? In this list or in your list? We will not, you will not be able to implement a system with a list of a hundred or even a fifty functional requirements. Each one of them is some days of work, a week, three, four days. It's not just a couple of hours, okay? Programmers always say, okay, it's a couple of hours for anything. 
Uh, it's never there. Uh, you need to, uh, the, the rule of thumb uh, for, for going from a programmer estimate to actual time is uh, double it and then move to the next uh, unit of measure. Okay, so if it's two hours, it becomes four days. If it's two days or three days, it will become six weeks. Okay, so this is the way of converting programmer's time or programmer estimates into real actual time for getting the functionality to work. Huh? And uh, okay, and this is for real. So in the reverse, uh, you, you can imagine only having maybe 12, 15, more or less functionalities, user level functionalities in your system. So you need to really be able to identify those that are more important for the demo, for the system working. So don't spend, for example, a lot of time in having a very complex login system and password recovery and double factor authentication or whatever that will eat you some time and some features and then you don't have time to implement the core of the project. So since we are trying to define requirements in a way that they can be plugged in and out and the system will still be consistent, uh, start uh, identifying the priority of each requirement for the functions. And then you have some non-functional requirements that are the rules that you must follow while implementing the functions. So you're not free to choose any language. You're not too free to choose any algorithm. You're not too free to choose any platform for running. You're not free to choose the, lang the user interface language. You're not free to choose the type of smartphone because the non-functional requirements tell you what is the environment, what are the constraints uh, that your system will support. And uh, they change everything. If I change, say, okay, the system one, for example, technical level, system level, non-functional requirement could be the specification of the programming language. So what we are saying, for example, we program the system in Python. Okay, probably it's not needed, but imagine you, it's needed. You implement the system, and then we change this requirement and we say we change it to from Python to JavaScript. It's a disaster. You need to throw everything away and start from the beginning, right? So while uh, changing one functional requirement as a local consequence, you need, all, you, did, you need only to change the code for that specific functionality. Adding one new functional requirement needs adding some code somewhere. But it's a still bad to change something in a system that is already working. But it can be managed because we are talking about local changes. Non-functional requirements speak globally. So when they say Android, it's every line of code is about Android. The language, the library, the user interface toolkit, the way you manage the, the windows and so on. You cannot change it later without destroying everything. So these are, they, they look like simpler. Okay, you're talking about the language, you're talking about the user interface, the supported, okay, you can, you will go onto the browser, which version, for example, of the browser, this operating system, this hardware, this response time, this maximum size of the database of the space occupied because we don't have more than that in, on the SD card, for example. So if you read them, you say, okay, they're, they're no big deal. Uh, but uh, remember that actually they are, they are influencing every line of code. So um, if a system doesn't support one of these functional requirements. Imagine that we have a, a non-functional requirements about uh, uh, response time. We say that the website should respond within 300 milliseconds, which is reasonable. More than that, it will feel slow. So it's easy to write. 
This means that every single web page you write, every single JavaScript event tender you write, should respect that maximum time. And if it doesn't work, it's not easy to say which are the lines of code to change. Maybe you discover that maybe you have to change something deeper. Something that you are computing on the server, you need to cache it on the clients because otherwise you cannot match the time because there's too much latency in the network communication. I don't know, just some, something that may happen. So if a non-functional requirement is not met, it's not, a, it's not at all easy even to identify what needs to be changed and, po and possibly a lot needs to be changed. So these are disrupting uh, this kind of the of requirements. Um, if you have even one line of code, one screen that is too slow, then your requirement is not satisfied, even if 98% of the system is fine. And talking about non-functional requirements, usually these are the types, the categories of NFRs, non-functional requirements that you can define. We are more interested in the product requirements about uh, usability. So is the system easy to use? What does it mean? Is there a number for that? Uh, yes. No. We can do some testing with users, say whether they are able to use it without any instruction or how many errors they do while uh, in using the system. Uh, it's usual. Usually when you have a system and you start designing an interface, you put some users, some test users in front of the system and say, okay, try to write a new post in the system. And you see them, you know, uh, trying to use the interface for getting the results done. And you understand how many errors, how many mistakes, how many wrong clicks they do. This is a measure of usability. So should we add some specification about the usability of a system so that the, the person we, who implements the system will be forced to, to, to respect that? Uh, efficiency. Efficiency is easier to understand. Efficiency is uh, time and space. How much time the system needs to perform their operations, how much space the system needs. So, for example, I said response time. Every web page responds in less than 300 millis. Or space. We only have uh, one gigabyte free for storing your data in the system. So this may change the way you handle sensor data, for example. So if you add more memory, you could think, you could imagine of storing your sensor data on the small computer that you have. But if you have a small space there, then you need to store the data, or you need either to find a way in which you don't need to store the data, if the functionality can be implemented without storing all the data, maybe only a small window, or find a way to store the data remotely somewhere else onto a bigger computer when you have terabytes, not gigabytes of memory. So depending on that number, your choice about the system design will change. Your choice about the, the algorithms will change. Because no, it, it's, a, it's a constraint that cannot be, cannot be negotiated. Say, OK, but I only have one giga, but I'm using 12. They are not there. You can use them because they are not available. So you must find a solution that respects that. <laughs> so um, portability. Portability means uh, what are the operating systems or the platforms on which the system can run. And this is especially for user interfaces. Is the interface uh, a web interface or a mobile interface or a desktop interface? And if it's a web interface, what are the browsers that it should be compatible with? If it's a mobile interface, what are the versions, Android, iOS, which versions should it be, should it be compatible with? 
if it's a desktop application, will it be a Windows desktop, a Linux desktop, a Mac desktop, or whatever? So what are the platform, and talking about these interfaces, the same could be done for the servers. The server code, okay, we are writing Python, so it should be, should be more or less portable. But are there any constraints about the server architecture? Should it be Linux? Could it be Windows? Are we using some library that is only available or some hardware that is only available on Windows? So this is the place uh, about limiting the portability. And beware, don't be too demanding on yourself. It's easy because it's only a sentence here writing, okay, the system should be able to run on any browser or any operating system or if you're writing that, you are committed to do that. So you are doubling or tripling your work. Even the browsers, I say, okay, every browser from the last three years. But then it means that you are trying to develop for one browser and test on all the other whether all your strength things still work. So it's better in this case to be specific. I'm presenting a system that is only running on those specific platforms, on those versions. And I won't try to do it universally. Okay? Uh, reliability is not something that is too interesting for us in this course because it's uh, about the capability of the system of running in time during long periods of time. The system may be perfect the day you open the box and it may crash two days later. So it's not very reliable. It works but not reliably, because something breaks up, or if the networks, is, uh, you know, if the Wi-Fi is not very good, then the system will, will not work uh, at all, or we crash or we hang. Uh, no? So there's something that will affect the long-term usage of the system. For us, long-term would be probably a couple of hours. During the demo, during the showcase, should be run, should run for a couple of hours, okay? Uh, without breaking. But of course, if you have some mechanical parts in your projects, uh, they are also important because they may get hung or may. So, this is something of lesser importance because we are only doing very short lived demos and not system that. Uh, but if you are turning that into a product, then it will be probably the most important, one of the most important uh, features. Okay, I buy this today. Will it last uh, two years? Because the warranty. In Europe, it's two years for customer goods. So if, it's, if, it, if it doesn't work at least two years, it's on you to replace it. Hmm? Okay, and then there are other types of non-functional requirements, more on the how to implement them. So the context of the organization in which uh, the system is being implemented. In this case, the organization is the course. And so what are the standards? Uh, uh, for example, we are saying that all the project, all the software you develop should be on GitHub, on your GitHub repository. Should be there. It's not mandatory for the system to work, but it's important for the organization, in this case the course, in which the system is being developed, or for which the system is being developed. So there are additional constraints, not too many, but on the ways, the language, we are using Python, we are using Raspberry, we are using those sensors, and so on. So these are additional non-functional requirements. Non-functional because we are not telling you what to do, but we are telling to do that in to do it to do it in that specific way, using Python, using GitHub, <coughs> and so on. And about external requirements, probably we don't uh, we don't need them, except for interoperability requirements. So if you need to interface with the Philips Hue lamp. For changing, for having a colored lamp that changes the color, okay, you need to interoperate with that specific device, and so you need to learn how you can speak with that device. What is the protocol? What is the language? How will you connect with that, and so on. So these are all external requirements. We don't decide it. We have no choice. If we want to use that device, we need to conform to the type of interface that the program interface that that specific device is able to offer. It's not our choice. It's an external choice. Of course, again, it's not a functional requirement. It doesn't tell me what to do with a Philips Hue lamp. It just tells us how 
to interact with the lamp if some function requires to, to modify, to change the, the lights in the lamp. So, just to summarize, uh, the most, uh, let's say, impacting, the non-functional requirement that will impact most, the most, our project will be interoperability that will come from the devices that you choose to use. Portability that depends on the devices in which you decide to provide the user interfaces and in which you decide to deploy the server side. Probably something about the space available, not much about performance. We are not doing real-time systems, hmm? not too much. And uh, something about the standard of implementation, about the tools uh, that we, we, are, we are providing. Hmm? So the rest are, in general, are still important, but in the context of our project will not have a major role. Okay, we, are, we have some example of non-functional requirements for our example system. So the mobile, inter mobile interfaces must be compatible with iOS given version, Android a given version, and so on. The system will be localized in many languages, and the default language will be English. What does it say? Number two, that I need to have a mechanism inside the system for defining different languages and for switching among the different languages. But at the moment, I only need to implement one of them, only English. Maybe French can be added at a, at a later time. Hmm? Uh, it's not very precise in this case, okay? A real non-functional requirement should also specify which kind of language. Okay? Uh, because the way we handle with different scripts is different. So when we are thinking about languages, we uh, tend to think about Western languages, okay? But, uh, and so it's easy to switch among them. You may you change the strings and so on. But you're, th you're thinking about, for example, Eastern languages are very different, about the encoding, about uh, uh, the file format and so on. You talk about Arabic languages in which you have all everything uh, right to left instead of left to right, and you also need to usually to switch to mirror the user interface, not just the text of a single on the individual button, because the intuitively left and right should be swapped. No? The menu, instead of being on the left, should be on the right. So it's, uh, it's also, it should be important also to define which kind of uh, sets of languages, which kind of uh, scripts, they call them, uh, we, we want to support. even if we implement only one, but all the mechanisms for switching should be there hmm? in this requirement. The, should be, the system should work in reduced conditions even if the user mobile device is switched off or disconnected, which is reasonable. I'm creating a mobile wake-up, uh, sorry, a wake-up service, and if my mobile runs out of battery, I need to be woken up. No? Or if doesn't, it's not connected to the Wi-Fi because of some problem with the, at the access point. So this is a very strong example of a non-functional requirement. It's a quality that the system should possess. It's a robustness quality. The system is, ro is robust enough that doesn't need the mobile device to be switched on and connected for the wake. Otherwise, you know, if you're sending a wake-up system that involves all your hours and so on, and then it's not working if, you're, if, if you forgot the phone in your car or if the battery runs out, it's useless. Okay? So it's important. It's an important requirement compared to a system that doesn't implement this. Okay. Now we agree that it's important. Try to imagine the implications of this. In how many places of your code you should have the course, the code forking in two different cases? If the smartphone is on, then do this. If the smartphone is off, then do this. 
a lot of other strategies. You say uh, we are we are able to change the the ringing the ringtones. Okay, but the ringtones are on the phone. If the phone is off, what can we play? Okay, we should have a default ringtone to use when the phone is off. And some other speaker, which is not the phone speaker, to play that, that, that the music through. So you have a simple requirement like this. It's just one sentence, and it makes it reasonable. It's normal. It's a selling point to the users. It will have a huge impact on the implementation of the system. They are so disruptive, this kind of uh, non-functional requirements. Every function. Of course, we should identify in reduced conditions. So we cannot assume that if the smartphone is off, uh, all the system functionality should be available. Only some of them. Which ones? Okay, so we need to define what we mean by reduced conditions. We should list which are the, non the functional requirements that still need to work when the smartphone is not available. So we have a long list of functional requirements that are the full functionality of the system. And some of them will have an, an asterisk, a mark, and say, OK, these should also work in reduced conditions. And, and for those marked as with an asterisk, uh, we need to provide a dual behavior when the smartphone is available, when it's not available. Um, and so on. So all the user interfaces, the versions, the browsers, the resolution of the, of the screen, and so on, is also the more you specify, no, the easier it is to implement the system because you are you have a more specified context. Uh, you don't need to imagine about different uh, resolutions or different devices, and so on. Hmm? So in your code. Uh, in your requirement, which will be the deliverable of numbers two will contain the functional and non-functional requirements, we should make these two lists, the list of functional requirements and the list of non-functional requirements hmm, that match your system design. That will be the definition of the system. Given these two lists, uh, anybody could understand what the system does and start thinking about how to implement it. Uh, here I have a couple of, so no, there are eight criteria for checking the goodness of these requirements. Uh, so very quickly, uh, requirements should be correct. Hmm? Meaning that uh, they should actually ask uh, features that are really needed by the system. Hmm? So this, of course, is. They should be non-ambiguous. We said at the beginning requirements should also be uh, easy to check. Is it implemented or not? Is it working or not? Is it sat this point, is it satisfied or not? I turn the smartphone off. Is the system reacting properly or not? So if it's written in an ambiguous language, we will not be able to implement that correctly, nor to check it. So this is important that you try to write clear sentences, simple sentences, sharp sentences, yes or no. Uh, it should not be any maybe or possibly or depends uh, on the interpretation of the requirement. Ideally, they should be complete, saying that every aspect of the system should be represented by a functional requirement. So a client uh, should never be able to say, oh, but your system is fine, but this is missing. OK? Because if it's important, it should have been there in the first place, not discovered afterwards. If they want to add a new functionality later, fine, but they have to pay for that. Hmm? So try not to forget. Uh, all the possibilities and also, also all the good possibilities what the system does and also what the system, how the system should react if something goes bad. Um, consistency. So you are not allowed to say 
different things in different places. So on one place saying the minimum resolution should be 124 and somewhere else saying uh, it should be able to run on, sm on small screens. Uh, so it's, it's not easy because maybe you have in, in our case we have quite short lists, but if you have very long list of requirements, it may happen that you have uh, conflicting requirements somewhere. Um, and of course, not only it's not easy, but it's not uh, theoretically possible Okay, it's a, there's a theorem that says that no set of requirements could be at the same time complete and consistent. Because you either stop at a given point, at a given level of detail, and so formally you are not complete. Or you can add further and further details, and so the risk uh, of being consistent increases because you are adding more information and you, the number of checks you need to do to ensure cons um, consistency is increasing. So we should strive for a good balance. Huh? So be, be reasonably sure that uh, we have a good coverage completeness, a good coverage of the system functionality, and uh, sharp definition with no overlap and no, ambigu and no, no ambiguity and no um, conflicts. And uh, an important point here is when you're writing uh, requirements, uh, try to rank them. Maybe because the first time you may have a list of, a longer list, 50 requirements, 100 requirements, 80. Because when, when you're sitting there and brainstorming about what the system can do, a lot of ideas come up. And you don't want to throw those, those ideas away. So you write them down. They're possible functions of the system. But then you should pick them one by one and give them a priority. Priority one, two, three. One means I need to implement this in the first version of the system. Priority two means uh, I will implement it later. Priority three means, uh, or maybe in the future we'll think about that. It's nice to have, but it's not essential. Try, try to do that at the beginning, before starting implementation, so that you already have a plan, a master plan and a contingency plan. What do you mean? You have a master plan saying, okay, in the first version of the system, I will include all, all functionality, all uh, requirements with priority one. And if I have more time, I can include some requirements of priority two. So one, the priority one should be the minimum system that you are committing to, the, to deliver. And priority two should, could, could be included if you have time at the end. But if time is shorter, you need to know what to drop. And believe me, when you are late, you are stressed, and the system doesn't work, and you need to debug and so on, it's, the, it's not a good moment to think about whether this or that functionality is more important. I need to remove something, but what? So if you do that at the beginning, where we are still clear-minded, clear minded, we decide in a neutral way, this is more important than that. And so if we have more time, we do also that. If we don't have enough time, we drop this. No discussion about which one is better. We already had all the discussion at the beginning, up front. Uh, so it's also a sort of a project management tool. The project can adapt to the available time or to the difficulties that you can find while you go because you already have a list of priorities. And you can start the implementation in the list of priorities. First, more important, and then less important. Features. So, probably the ranking is one of the most important features and also the, way, uh, the, the reason why we are trying to do a list of requirements. So that each one of them can be, can be ranked separately, one to three, or one to five, or one star, two stars, uh, one heart, uh, well, use the system you like, as long as you are able to say, okay, I have less time, what I can sacrifice, or I have more time, what can I include? Uh, okay, we already talked about verifiable, so a, a requirement is only valid if when the system is running, you can compare the system with the requirement and say, okay, this is checked, it's verified, it's satisfied or not. It's another way of saying uh, it should be not ambiguous, but in addition, probably we should start thinking about how to verify them. 
a procedure for refining them. Okay? And we are not perfect. Nobody is able to predict the future or to anticipate all the issues that will come out. So prepare for modifying them. We have a good list. We have thought a lot. Uh, we discussed a lot. We brainstormed a lot. We, we defined the functional requirement, the non-functional requirement, put priorities to each of them. But at the end, uh, something is different from what we expect. Uh, and uh, uh, we need to modify some behavior, some function. Uh, we, we thought it could be implemented with that sensor, but at the end, the sensor doesn't have the necessary, cap necessary capabilities. So we need actually to change the project. Okay. So uh, it's, it's not forbidden. Okay. We will ask you at the beginning of May to write the list of requirements. But of course, if it's needed, you can change them. Possibly, it's better to keep track of the changes. So uh, we, I change this for this reason. Okay, especially then in, uh, when you are when, when you're working with the external contracts, uh, every modification of the of the um, of the requirement should be agreed among the two parts, the parties. And this also implies having a form of uh, traceability. This requirement is here because we had a previous discussion in which we decided that that would be important. And forward, uh, these requirements uh, is implemented in this source code module, in this library developed by this person, uh, so that we have a chain that says, uh, ideally, for every line of code, uh, what is the set of decisions that brought from the initial idea to that specific line of code. But this is something heavy to do. But in some industries, this is required. They use special tools for writing documentation in which they trace actually the parts, uh, the, the schematics, the diagrams, the code to the lines of the documentation. Uh, there are special tools in the aerospace industry, for example, they, are a lot, uh, uh, they do a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. But for us, it's easier, of course, because the, the, um, the project is smaller. OK, uh, we don't want to be strict about the formal. This is an example of a standard of a requirements document will not follow that. Uh, we'll have something much simpler. So all of this uh, idea about functional requirements and non-functional requirements will be the subject of the liberal of number two due at the beginning of May, as we, as we said. And so later on, so because right now we have to focus first <laughs> on the idea and then on the liberal one, the vision, right after that. Uh, so we don't want to spend too much time on this issue because we, we, we don't even know about the project, so it would be difficult to make examples. Uh, but later on, during the middle of, of, of April, we will make a class in which uh, we'll try to make some examples together and see the template uh, you know, for, the, for the kind of information that needs to be in this deliverable number two. Hmm? Okay, so this is what I uh, wanted to tell you today. So I leave you for a small break and then some fun with Python later with Luigi.